Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this fifth session of the ICESA Trade Credit Insurance Week. With more than 3,100 registrations and 1,000 unique registrants, this first week is proving to be quite a success, which makes me really happy. Now, all panels are recorded and posted to a private YouTube channel at the end of the week. So people who have registered will receive the link to this channel and can watch again and again and again. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce this next panel to you entitled The Development in the U.S. Credit Insurance Market. Not all that long ago, Europeans pointed to the U.S. for the lack of success of their product there, even though the oldest underwriter in credit insurance in the world is American, ACI, American Credit Indemnity, now Allianz Trade. Statements like credit insurance just not being part of the entrepreneurial culture and uh, the country just being too large was used to explain the relative lack of success. And indeed, for those of you who listened this morning, it even resonates to this day. But a couple of decades later, I see an industry which is thriving and diverse, even though I don't think the country shrank in the meantime. Now for ICISA, this is our firstly first firmly non-European panel, so we're excited. And to lead you through the development of the US market, I give you Brett Halsey as moderator of the panel. Now, don't let his youthful Floridian looks fool you. Brett's been in the industry for decades and knows the market like the back of his hand. So Brett, <laughs> to you, man. Thank you, Richard, very much. I appreciate it. You, um, mm-hmm. Thanks for stealing all my thunder. Now I have no introduction to the uh, committee, but uh, <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Um, he mentioned uh, American Credit Indemnity. Just to show, I guess, uh, some of us on the panel that have been around a while, that was my fish, first interview was with ACI, and I'll, uh, I'll touch on that in a moment. But first, let me uh, go around the, uh, the room and invite uh, my friends. And, and I say that in so much that we really want this uh, – next hour to be informal, be very informative, and at the same time, uh, uh, just a a chat amongst old friends who have been in the business for a very long time. Let me first introduce Scott Edian, who is the EVP and global head of Willis Towers Watson. Scott, I've I've known Scott for 25 years, and I think I worked with him at, uh, at an organization for over 13 years, so glad to be on point with him. Next is Mills Ramsey, who I've also worked very closely with. Mills is the credit risk manager for Chubb, and uh, I know he's new to Chubb, so I know he's uh, finding his way through that organization, but based on his level of experience, one of the greatest uh, credit minds that I've, I've ever worked with. And last but certainly not least is Gordon Sesford, who is the uh, president and regional uh, head and director of uh, Tradius for the North American Group. And uh, Gordon, While we haven't worked together, I've known Gordon for for a long time. So when Richard asked me to do this, I said, well, you know, Richard, I really don't like these things that much. But he said, well, well, here's the panel. And I'm like, "Okay, that's cool. I can do this. (laughs) So uh, actually very excited to be part of this. So with that, again, instead of me asking questions, we thought, you know, with the the old crew sort of as a fireside chat, just sit around, talk about credit insurance a little bit, but really talk about the development of trade credit in the U.S. So I wanted to give a little bit of a history lesson uh, to to sort of complement what Richard had indicated. But also we are, as as Scott and and Mills and Gordon go through their pieces, we are going to have some poll questions for the audience. So when uh, when conversation starts, we do ask that you please indeed uh, do put um, some thought into the poll questions, but it's actually going to start when Mills uh, uh, starts his piece. Then we'll ask some questions and banter about. Feel free. I know there's a question bar uh, that's available to the audience. Feel free to ask any questions that you may have. So with that, I I, I go back to American Credit Indemnity. Uh, first interview in the late 80s, coming right out of college. <laughs> Thought I was a little bit of a you know smart aleck, and I, I could see if I could impress uh, who was interviewing me. And they asked me, what's the most important asset in any business? So I sat there and I thought about it. I'm like, well, I guess the typical answer would be, you know, your employees. Uh, Well, maybe it's the product that you're selling. Well, maybe it's your equipment and property. But then I said, you know what? It's cash flow. That's your most important asset. So I'd say accounts receivable. 
And he said, you're spot on. Now, again, with those typical answers being in play and maybe being a little um, uh, to the point in regards to cash flows, when you look at your business, what do you want? You've got to have working capital. You've got to have cash flow in order to survive. So cash and capital are absolutely king in today's environment and even 30 plus years ago. So I asked the question and he asked me, so if you're going to have your employees insured, your equipment insured, your property insured, why wouldn't you insure your receivables? And you spot on. And I, I've asked that question a lot when I sit in front of clients or folks that are very, aren't very familiar with trade credit. And I think over the course of time, and at least I can tell you in my 30 plus years, we have seen an incredible uh, enhancement in terms of credit capabilities, knowledge uh, of the product line itself. And uh, we'll talk about that uh, in various other uh, factors uh, during the course of the hour. A little more history. Trade credit, is, again, has been around for well over 100 years. And I think it was derived in the 19th century back in Europe. But really between the, the First and Second World Wars is when it was developed most for a lot of cross-border trade. And as Richard indicated, why wasn't you know, this, with the sophistication of the U.S., really kicking off in the U.S. too much? Because I think a large part of it is there were so many different financial instru instruments in the U.S. You have put options. You have letters of credit. You have bank discounting programs. You have factoring. All the different levels of, of hedging of risk that inclusive of trade credit, uh, certain clients might be or customers might be more familiar with dealing with a lot of their bank business. So trade credit has been a very difficult sale. And I know Scott can tell you during the course of his sales over his 30 years of experience, it's very difficult to, to infiltrate, so to speak, in terms of the, the actual credit folks working with respective clients. Um, when you look at you know 30 years ago, I would say in the U.S., premium levels, and again, don't quote me on this, and I know we're being recorded, so I don't want anybody coming back saying you were wrong, but I'm pretty sure there were four carriers in, in the late 80s of which U.S. premiums were just less than $500 million. Right now, there's over 20-plus carriers. And again, a lot of them are European, but still are, are admitted or, or, or work in the U.S. Uh, with over, I'd probably say, 1 to 1.2 billion in U.S. trade credit premiums which is great, which is showing 30 years in a period of time, quite a development, quite an increase in overall premium and, and what we're doing with the products. Uh, and when you talk about products, the ingenuity, the creativity of the brokers, of the carriers during the course of this period of time have been great. You have your typical you know, outsourcing, your, your, your whole turnover programs, your excess of loss, but we've gotten even deeper into the bank policies, into the product finance policies, into political risk, into structured trade and political risk, which has really, I think, over the course of time, been more the go-to than a lot of the vanilla, more, I'd say, European-based type programs. But again, you're always going to need your multiple multi-buyer, and there's always um, requirements for pure risk mitigation, which is really the genesis of why folks do buy trade credit insurance. But there's also concentration risk. There's also how can we enhance your terms of sale? How can we enhance your financing through your bank? All your foreign receivables, which were previously not covered by your bank, are now covered because you have that wrapped around a well investment grade, you know, credit insurance company. Those are things that you know have really, I think, taken trade credit and offshoots of trade credit to the next level, and we're really excited about that. Um, the market as well, and I know Scott's going to talk a, a little bit about that in terms of the bank business and, and what we're seeing in terms of growth opportunities. Oh. But of the 30 years, and again, uh, you know, outside of Mills, I, I can speak for, for Gordon and Scott. We've been here a little longer. Um, we've seen you know, currency devaluations uh, during the course, particularly in Latin and South America. We've seen the global financial crisis. We've had to underwrite through those. But really, over the last 10 years, the credit market itself has been generally benign until COVID hit. And then even with COVID, based on the structure, based on the free cash and, and, and the free cash flow and liquidity that was offered by the banks, we did not see the level of bankruptcies that we thought we were, were going to see. However, during the course, really, of the last 10 years, we've seen the likes of Sears, of Toys R Us, Sports Authority, Henley Ong, 
and many other bankruptcies that that came and didn't so much just bite us out of surprise, but some did, some didn't, and some you can manage through with your with your client base. So again, very important and very. Let me use the word that um, that was used earlier this morning during the panel, which I watched. There's so much uncertainty in the world, even during good times. You've got to really take control of, of the, the, the buyer portfolio, the credit, the project that you may be working on. And if you can secure your cash, either through offloading it off your balance sheet or wrapping it around a credit insurance policy, again, why wouldn't you do it? Now, over the last 18 months, we're seeing quite the shift and the shift in terms of recessionary climate, 40 year inflation rate uh, or high in inflation um, rates. So I think I read a stat where I think the average American family will have to spend anywhere between five to seven thousand dollars more a year just to buy the same things that they bought last year in terms of consumption. And with two thirds of GDP being consumer spending, we're already seeing and, and Mills will certainly touch on a tightening of that which we have to, uh, you know, not sell through in terms of scare tactic, but reality. And I go back to that word uncertainty, and that's really going to be the key. So with that, let me turn it over to the panel and have uh, Scott first from, uh, again, broker perspective, give us the views of, of really what's happening in, in terms of disruption, but at the same time, where we're seeing more growth opportunities in the banks and also some commonality with policy language and the like to really help offset some of this uncertainty. So Scott, let me turn it over to you. Great. Thank, thanks, Brett, for having me. And Richard, thank you on behalf. Uh, thank you and ICISA for having us here on the panel. Absolutely. But yeah, no, uh, I mean, you, you kind of hit on it. Um, you know, it's been a benign period and I would even call and maybe to maybe, um, uh, the other panel members won't agree, but I even think the pandemic was somewhat benign. It, it was we had a spike in losses, but nothing that was a lights out scenario. And again, the way I thought it was going to be a black swan event when this first hit, um, and I thought it was going to be the worst of my career. So you, you sort of look back to going to the global financial crisis and and maybe mark 2010 as the period of time for 12 years we've gone through one blip really, which is the pandemic, and that blip wasn't anywhere near what the GFC was. So you still then have some soft market conditions that because the losses aren't really coming through uh, and now we're facing this uh, this uh, recession period and now we're starting to brace ourselves that yes, there could be losses. I mean, the handwriting's on the wall now. But again, how how hard will these be? How deep will these be? We don't know, right, at this point. But 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 safe to say that we know the loss rates are, are going to go up. From a, from a growth perspective, <clears throat> you're looking at the banks have driven a lot of the growth over the last 10 years in this market. And if you look at a traditional buyer, a corporate buyer of trade credit, they're doing nothing but risk transfer at this point, right? So they're buying the product for that. Banks, I would argue, are buying it for monetization purposes. Risk transfer becomes a byproduct, right? So if you take a supply chain finance, for example, and you're, you're a bank that's, that's now banking everybody in that supply chain, you're using trade credit as a tool Yes, to offset concentrations, but supply chain really becomes and, and, and trade credit really becomes a, a tool to help monetize, not to transfer bad buyers to an insurance company for them to take the hit. Um, I, will, I will tell you in my career, and this goes back to my underwriting days, I have yet to have a loss, a paid loss on a bank deal. That's not because there were denied claims. That's because the quality of the bank programs that we're seeing in the market over the last 10 years is very high. And the banks are typically um, off laying double B, uh, single B plus at worst credits up to uh, investment grade credits in the market. And that's a pretty healthy portfolio. And they're able to use that trade credit as a way of, of relieving their, their limits uh, capacity. So if you look at Basel III and, and you look at you know, what, what we're trying to do as an industry uh, and look at capital relief, you have the banks in the United States who really aren't enjoying capital relief because the Reg Q requirements haven't been flushed out as, as much as in Europe where CRR has been flushed out. Therefore, the U.S. banks are mostly purchasing uh, trade credit insurance more for limits relief than capital relief. There are some capital relief policies in the market but if you look at why they're more in Europe versus the United States, it's because 
CRR in Europe has been around for 20 years. Red Q has been around for seven years. Therefore, you have a much more developed market in Europe than you do here in the United States. So when CRR came out, you had a lot of banks and brokers uh, pushing the CRR to be able to say, and let me step back for it. Red Q is basically CRR, but CRR has been more highly negotiated by the industry because there's so much pressure to be able to use trade credit for capital relief purposes. So all that pressure over the last 20 years has really led to a better interpretation uh, by the attorneys providing those opinions to be able to get capital relief in the UK. If you pull back to, to Red Q, even though the, the wording is a little bit different, it's basically CRR wording, but you have an unconditionality aspect of, of things. It's a little bit different here. Um, so that's creating uh, some more pressure that the industry is going to have to be able to provide to the federal body to be able to say, what does that actually mean? How can we use this policy for replacement purposes? To give you the scope of the market, the market in the United States for capital relief versus the market in Europe it probably is around uh, five to one, meaning it, it's so much more developed in, in Europe than it is in the US. But you're getting bankers that just like we do, Brett, we all work for each other at one sense. You know, we're all change uniforms every now and then. The same thing's happening in the banking community. And you'll have bankers that have been working under capital relief laws in Europe and now coming to the United States saying, why aren't we doing this? Why aren't the US banks doing this? So there's gonna be a push a bigger push as there's more education and more pressure to be able to have the banks um, provide some some capital relief uh, using using the trade credit as a substitute. Um, if you look at one of those that that unconditionality, the, the part on the red Q side, one of the big things is dispute. And what is the difference between if you look at trade credit insurance, what we do, multi buyer, single buyer trade credit versus non payment insurance? Most of those opinions that you have in Europe are based on non-payment insurance. So you have, you know, it's a loan. You have one obligor. You don't have a disputes clause. Here, when you're looking at trade credit, multi-buyer trade credit, you have a dispute clause. And one of the big hurdles to get over is the fact that the insurers just can't waive a dispute clause and make it unconditional. So there's going to have to be some negotiation on that aspect of that. Um, so that's where TCI is so different. That leads also into the nuclear exclusion clause. So in, under these MPI programs, a lot of the advanced banks have nuclear exclusion uh, in their policies because they're able to underwrite around them and allow that and still get a clean opinion on that, where maybe standardized banks cannot. NPI policies don't have a nuclear exclusion clause. A lot of them don't, don't even have it. So you have a lot of those same insurers now that are offering trade credit insurance um, but they have the nuclear exclusion clause and they don't have the ability to waive that. They may have a small bucket where they can waive the nuclear exclusion clause. So under Red Q rules, if you're looking at the unconditionality, you might have to remove the nuclear exclusion. There's only so much capacity. So that's a that's another hurdle that hopefully Bos four down the road, you know, which is going to be what late 2023 into 2024. Hope, hopefully we see some relief in these areas to be able to open up more of the U.S. banks to be able to utilize the tool of trade credit to, to gain some capital relief. From a market perspective, and I'll get on my soapbox a little bit, there's so many different forms out there that provide a capital relief policy. Everybody has their own form. The banks negotiate them uh, with their brokers. They have an insurance panel on, 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 uh, in place and they try to you know, continue to widen that panel out to, to all insurers. But, but the issue with that is, is you have all these bespoke wordings. At the end of the day, pretty much doing the exact same thing. There are some, some nuances that might be better or worse, but that really comes down to underwriting the bank, right? Some banks are better at workouts than others. Some banks are, are more disciplined than others. And that becomes an underwriting aspect, is if you want to be able to introduce a nuance that provides a little bit more latitude for a bank than you would over bank X versus bank Y, right? So it's more, I'll put that more in the underwriting side. But what I'd like to see and what we push for is to really have a harmonized policy to really remove the, the, the secrecy, the veil, if you will, on all these NDAs that are in place, come up with a policy that the market can get behind 
because in my opinion, if you're going to, if you're going to really want to grow the bank business, you're going to have to have standardization in the policies. And, and in order to do that, you got to get the industry behind it. Um, now, when I say standardization, uh, and I've, I've been schooled by attorneys on this, there is no standard policy. I get that. We all get that. But it's a basic template policy in which 90% of it's been negotiated. There's always that 10% that is deal specific or bank specific uh, on that. So there will be that. But the idea of it is, is that we all recognize the animal, the four corners of that policy is capital relief ready. Uh, and now we're just doing these last nuances that, hey, I have a great relationship with this bank. This bank's number one in your ability to work something out. There's a lot of trust. Therefore, I give them a little bit more, more latitude. That's an underwriting aspect. So, but, but instead of negotiating something from front to finish, we're negotiating the last 10%. So if you think about that, it's a time saver for the bank, for the insurance companies, um, and it's also, it expedites the law firm's opinions. When we get to the capital relief opinions, it, it expedites all of that. So all we're trying to do is come up with something because I feel that if we continue with bespoke forms and we continue with brokers to say, this is my form as a broker and it's the most special form, I think we're going to remain a cottage industry. We're never going to grow and we're never going to blow the lid off the ability for U.S. banks to really grow in this market and use trade credit as a tool. Because if you think about it, if you can replace and use trade credit for capital purposes and you can bring down your 8% requirement down to 20% of that, you look at the capital relief that provides, you'll have a, a, a flight to quality. You'll have the insurance, the insurers will pick up a lot of investment grade risk because they're transferring that to the insurance companies for capital relief purposes. So it's a win for the banks. It's a win for the insurance companies. So it's really kind of a nice collision course uh, with the banks and insurance companies, which is completely different than when I started 30 years ago when neither one really trusted each other, right? Um, but now it's become a true partnership. And I see RayQ Capital Relief as a way of bringing that partnership and strengthening that. And again, 30 year history, not one paid loss on the bank deal. That shows you there's a lot of quality in the market today. And again, I'm not saying there's no paid losses on bank deals. It's just my experience, right? There's a lot of quality deals out there and, and this is a good product and a great offset, if you will, for the insurance companies who are insuring corporates and are insuring in retail sectors and more difficult sectors. So this is a great offset to have a low loss ratio product sitting in the insurance company's side to, to, to off balance you know, some of those losses they're getting in the more volatile sections. Scott, that's great. Thank you for that. It, let, let me ask one question, because I know I've participated in several uh, sessions with you and, and, and uh, multiple carriers in regards to a lot of this conversation about commonality of, of, of language for the for the banks. Can you comment at all on the acceptance of the carriers of this? Because it seems like, yes, there's state re requirements and certain you know regulatory oh. requirements we have to deal with. What What's What's the general acceptance uh, to, to come together uh, as a kumbaya from, from the carrier market? Well, when we started this, uh, we have 45 firms, which are carriers, law firms, and um, brokers and banks, right? So we all came together and trying to get 45 firms to input on policy language is it's a nightmare, absolute nightmare. And God bless the attorneys and everybody on these underwriting teams that went through all this with us for, for years. We went through this. So did we get consensus from the entire market, banks, insurers on this wording? We did not. However, we had a lot of their input and we put it into the program. And what we came up with as a body was something that is definitely in the market and definitely acceptable. And now what we're trying to do, uh, in fact, I have uh, several clients now uh, and some new banks coming into the, the equation using that wording as their base wording. And again, we're negotiating those last 10%. So having that, so, Again, is it going to happen today? It's not. But if we start to look at something and we start getting behind it, um, slowly it's going to be adopted. So to me, maybe it's at the end of my career. I, I finally see a full adoption of something like this. And I'm, I'm happy that we we were part of it. That's great. Um, but it's not going to be in the next you know, two, three, four, five years. But it will slowly continue to go down that road. We just need more people in the industry. But lastly, think about this. On a trade credit perspective, 
when you're looking at, and especially about, you, you talked about, I said the flight of quality, if we can crack the nut here, get capital relief for U.S. banks and get that down to a fraction of what they're reserving today, now you're looking at a lot of um, a lot of opportunity coming in where the capacity can't be swallowed by one insurance company. So you're going to have to be able to um, syndicate this and the banks may have to participate it. So now you, you could bring in 10 different participants. You could bring in eight different insurance companies. Well, in order for capital relief to work, everybody's got to have their own policy. So that you would have like a lead bank and then you would issue it to, let's say there's 10 participants, 10 participant banks, but you'd wrap it all together where, you know, some one reports a pass through, all report a pass through. There's got to be a commonality. So all that's got to be done, but that's, you can't get capital relief by having a lost pay endorsement. You got to get it by issuing separate policies. So there's much more development for us to do. This was the first step and I see mm -hmm. multiple steps happening, but these aren't hard steps to do. It just needs more and more people to get behind it to say, this makes sense and this will grow our industry. And I'll continue to do that until my last breath. I believe in it. I love it. And I think it's good for the industry, not just good for my company. It's good for the industry. And that's what I want no to be able to provide. Right. Yeah. No question. Thank you for that, Scott. And again, that is, uh, I think all of us can, can confirm and feel engaged in the fact that that is certainly a growth opportunity because everyone has their network. You open up the bank's networks and the number of banks that we can, you know, play with you're you're opening up the u.s market there's no question about that so mm -hmm. thank you for that scott and that's a great broker's perspective in terms of you know how we are going to continue to grow and where we're going to grow i'm going to turn the table a little bit and and ask uh, mills uh, to speak a little bit on the the credit markets what we've seen over the course of some time and and what uh, his some of his projections are i know mills you have a poll question and i'll let you introduce that and i'll, I'll turn it over to you Cool. Thank you, Brett. And, uh, and thanks, Richard. And I see some for organizing. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, I just wanted to bring the perspective of what we're looking at from a risk side. I mean, um, in terms of the, the U.S. industry development, you know, I joined the industry in 2010, just after the, the, the last major financial crisis. My understanding was in the aftermath of that, there were a lot more, uh, you know, potential clients raising their hands saying, hey, I, I'm interested in credit insurance now. Um, and, you know, based, based on uh, maybe our current events and, and just your risk picture, you might be thinking that this is also a good time where it, there may be another bump um, in, the, in the overall penetration of the U.S. market. But uh, before we do that, a quick audience survey, if I can get that popped up, we have a survey, a poll question. So that is for everybody, which will be the most impactful to credit in the next 12 months? The global inflation, Europe's energy crisis, a strong U.S. dollar, or disrupted supply chains? And I'll be interested to, to get the audience vote and see you know, what people think about that. And we'll, we'll look at those results here shortly. Um, yeah, and I think it's kind of cool to see the live results uh, coming in. So, um, but anyways, I'll, I'll let uh, people answer while I talk here. So I think uh, obviously this year has been very interesting. And I think especially September, I feel like the mood got a little bit darker. Um, in other words, I feel like there was a little bit more being shaken and waking up this month for a lot of people. Um, where we, we see this, you know, we talk to clients, clients have questions about our risk outlook when we talk to them about their buyer underwriting. When we talk to buyers, we're also getting a lot more tangible indications that they're seeing some of the things that we're worried about, they're actually facing them. Um, so just like a quick view of the headlines, like what does everybody know? Okay, well, inflation is elevated nearly everywhere right now. So looking at CPI type numbers, US 8.3%, UK plus 9.9%, the Netherlands 12%, you got Brazil 8.7%, India 7%, and it's, it's much higher than normal. Um, our interest rates are higher. Business and personal loans are all costing more now. Everything's more expensive. Um, global supply chains were stressed prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It adds another layer now. Uh, it's become more complicated. Uh, GDP growth expectations continue to be revised downward. So if, if you watch, you know, whether it's World Bank or IMF or various central banks, you know, you'll see the numbers are coming down. So if you look at like global growth after growing 6.1% last year, uh, we're looking at 3.6% this year, which is significantly slower. And when you think of the, the size of the global economy and, and the trillions of dollars, each one of those percentage points, each one of those tenths of percentage points is a massive step downward. Um, US GDP growth is projected at 2.4 this year and then to fall to 1.6 next year. Uh, that, that one was a, quite a bit eye-opening. It's still positive growth, but it's significantly slower. Um, 
China, who no longer grows at 6% per year reliable, reliably, um, is looking at somewhere around 3%. It was actually World Bank revised yesterday from 3.3 down to 2.8. Um, so the revisions are coming in and the corporate sector is starting to send clearer warnings that I think are being heeded a bit more, um, whether it's FedEx or if it's one of the big retailers, you're hearing people with tangible experience say there's a slowdown coming. We're, we're seeing it right now. So, you know, risks are higher and we're talking to people about, uh, about their risks. And so to kind of bring it all together and, you know, what are the like, most key areas that we're looking at right now? Um, you know, I bring it down to like three major areas and, um, you know, to use just a metaphor, you know, the three heads of risk, like the three heads of Cerberus, the mythical dog, right? So if, if, if risk is a dog, here's your three heads. I, all the other ones, the other metaphors get overused, like three legs of a stool, three pillars of some Greco-Roman structure. So let's do something different today. So the first is the supply chains, right? So supply chains, if you think about things that happened over the last couple of years, remember the ever given ship stuck in the Suez Canal. You have, the COVID, you have COVID driven port shutdowns in China. You got trucker shortages in the US. Um, it's, if you measure by the global supply chains, the New York Fed has this tool called the Global Supply Chain Pressure Index. And currently it's, it's compared to its long-term average, it's two standard deviations higher than its long-term average. So what that means is that we're currently in the top two and a half percent of stress uh, in terms of supply chains. And that's pricing, that's slowness, that, that's everything. Now it's come down a bit since earlier in this year, but that's still very elevated. Um, just indicates we're, we're not finished with this yet. Um, but you know, suppliers from the start of COVID were just shocked by demand. I mean, think of all the things we were ordering at home and, and all the boxes that arrived on your front doorstep. Um, it really hit things quickly. And that the higher shipping traffic, you started to get congestion at ports and these backups. Um, this year, then you add in the Russia-Ukraine war and you have serious uh, you know, impacts to energy, to food and fertilizers, uh, countries that relied on importing wheat and crops like that. Um, some are just unavailable or some just take longer to deliver. Um, where in China, you know, it's the world's second largest economy, and it's the supplier to the world, you know, their zero COVID policy has led to a lot of lockdowns, I mean, rolling lockdowns, if you will, whether it be a city or a manufacturing plant or, you know, just locking people in their homes, it's been very serious and has severely disrupted their ability to continue to produce goods and ship them out at a rate that we're used to. Um, on top of that, they had a drought and a heat wave this year. They use a lot of hydropower. So they've had power shortages. And because of that, they've had to make, make choices and priority. And uh, they've had to close a lot of production this year or just say, hey, this is gonna be closed for the next month until you know, we have enough power to, to get out here. So the actual you know, manufacturing of goods in China has been severely disrupted as well this year. Um, big headlines like semiconductors. And everybody knows about the automotive semiconductor shortage. You know, the, the lead times now are still six months. It's still six months for the autos to get semiconductors when it used to be just one or two. Um, and the way that's, that's impacting them, so, you know, if you look at like Ford, Ford has over 40,000 partly manufactured vehicles sitting, just sitting around its plants waiting for the last couple of parts. And it's not just semiconductors either. It, it, it's other parts of the supply chain because automotive supplies, tier one, tier two, tier three, the commodities and raw materials that go into them, every, you know, any layer that goes, uh, has a problem and, and the, the link in the chain gets broken. Um, General Motors has twice that many, they have 95,000 vehicles waiting for the last couple of parts before they can ship them out to the dealerships. And, and, the, and the big OEMs are not in the business of holding finished cars. I mean, they want them out of there. That's, that's their business model. Um, so the supply chain stresses are not as bad as a few months ago, but they're still a major problem. Um, and so we're thinking about with our trade credit clients, how their supply chains are going to be impacted. And with their buyers, we're asking the same question so we can understand their risks. Uh, the second head of, of our Cerberus is energy. So anyone on this call who's in Europe is experiencing this firsthand. So energy is going through an energy crisis right now, uh, especially with natural gas, because the Russian supplies are either being cut off or reduced. And it, it's a major disruption we're now looking for the policy responses because governments in Europe, the ECB are all trying to come up with what to do. Will it be price caps, producer tariffs, uh, other special taxes on various companies to redistribute somehow? Will they find new sources? Uh, for example, Germany recently entered a deal with the United Arab Emirates to get LNG shipped directly to them. 
Um, there, there's also problems of just the power is so much more expensive now in parts of Europe. So um, in the aluminum business, for example, aluminum smelting is one of the most energy intensive businesses you can be in. And with the way the prices are, you're, you're 10x in some cases where you were a year ago. So uh, an aluminum executive recently said, he said, you know, the, the market price right now for aluminum is 2,500 euros a ton. But my cost to produce the next ton of aluminum is going to be 10,000 euros a ton. My unit economics are so off right now. That's why we've closed down, you know, XYZ plant. Um, and overall, Europe has shut down about 50%, no joke, 50% of aluminum smelting production capacity because the power is so expensive right now. Um, it's painful for consumers as well. I mean, their higher bills, uh, 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 Brett was hinting at this earlier, when you've got higher bills, you know, your discretionary spending gets impacted. You can't buy as much stuff anymore. Um, and businesses with these higher power bills in Europe are going to have to test how much cost can you pass along to your customers and how much margin are you going to have to eat or do you exit? I mean, there's going to be some difficult decisions. Uh, however, on the other hand, it's an opportunity for LNG exporters from other countries. Uh, so, for example, the U.S., the U.S. is churning out as much LNG as it possibly can out of those ports down in Louisiana and Texas to ship it over to Europe because the price of natural gas here is a fraction of what it is over there. Um, the U.S. produces more natural gas than it consumes. So we already have excess. Our price is much lower and they can ship it to a much higher price zone. So that is an opportunity in that sense. But it's a major crisis. Um, and this winter, I think this is something that really you know, could potentially get worse. But we'll, we'll see about the policy responses there. But, you know, whether you have customers in Europe or you're dealing with multinationals that have large portions of business in Europe, it, it's something worth thinking about and asking questions. And then the third, the third piece, the, the third head of servers here is inflation. Um, and I think that's probably the biggest headline that everyone's following and everyone's feeling. Um, you know, because of high prices, you, you're having negative real income growth. So our, our wages are not growing as fast as the inflation rate. Um, you know, as a reminder, ask your boss for a 9% raise this year. That's, to, I need to keep up with inflation. Sorry, don't, don't quote me. Uh, but um, consumers have been trading down because of this. And you see this from the reports that are coming out of the retailers. Walmart told us months ago this is happening. Target did too. And now, now you're starting to see more results where margins are contracting because we can't pass it along or because consumers just trade down to, you know, a store brand or something that's cheaper where the margins aren't as good. So corporate earnings are going to take a hit, you know, as consumers have to make different decisions there. Um, in a lot of cases, people will just won't buy. If it's something discretionary, they just won't buy it. And so what we've seen recently is that retailers, you know, they have more inventory than they planned on. So they're either trying to discount it and get out of the way before the holidays, or they're reducing the amount they would have ordered for the holidays. Um, I'll give you an example in consumer electronics. People slow down the purchases of consumer electronics so much this year that there's actually now a supply glut of semiconductors that are specifically made for, for these types of electronics. Um, and even though the automotive sector is struggling with a, with a deficit, they can't use the same type of chip. So th there's this irony of semiconductors where they don't have the right types to the right places right now. Um, but expect to see more promotions this holiday season. I mean, uh, S&P, they even said a week ago that this might be a red Friday this year instead of a black Friday, which, which would be a frightening thing. Um, but then, of course, with inflation, it's the policy responses. You know, that's, that's what is driving the interest rates. So your central banks, monetary tightening, um, how that's going to impact consumers and businesses because the cost of ownership is going to be higher. So a consumer making a decision to, to buy a car or a business deciding to build a new plant, they're going to have to think about financing and it's going to cost more now. Um, the capital markets are making some changes um, as the rates have moved up. Investment grade issuance has been falling in the high yield market. Uh, speculative grade issuance is down 73% this year compared to the same time last year. So three quarters less debt was issued by high yield issuers this year than last year, which is a huge number. And, and that's because as rates are higher, your cash outflows are going to increase and your coverage ratios are going to decline. Um, the new debt and refinancing is going to cost more. So managers have to decide, can I afford this? Um, and investors have to decide, is the price of risk worth it? Is the juice worth the squeeze, so to speak? So, um, so altogether, just, just pulling the whole thing together, what are we looking at going forward? What are we talking to clients about? You know, and, and our goal, of course, is to provide value where we can you know, tell people what we're thinking and seeing in markets and, and macro economies. So you know, we're watching for 
for company announcements on supply chains easing. Um, we're looking at different metrics there that we can find. Uh, at the same time, of course, declining demand will naturally start to reduce the stress in the supply chain as people are demanding fewer goods. Uh, two, we're watching what's happening in Europe with energy. We're going to see what the policy actions are going to be, what kind of government intervention, because there, there just must be. Uh, there's no way they'll stand by and let people pay 10 times their utility bill and then for businesses to have to you know, make decisions of, of raising their prices uh, by triple digit percentages. Uh, so watch for that. And then um, just the price levels, you know, back to the inflation. When will they start evening out? Looking at the month over month comparison to you know, get low, consistently low, so that we're not uh, on such a steep trajectory. But how will you know when, when your central banks are done with the tightening? It, the labor markets will tell them that. So you'll be watching your unemployment rate. You'll be watching job creation, destruction numbers. Um, they will not overly destroy jobs. Um, and that will, you know, depending on how they plan, that will be the point they start to pull back uh, and either go neutral or, or to easing. So keep your eyes on that um, because we need price stability. That, that's one of the most important things in my view is, you know, stable prices incentivize business investment, job creation and company formation. So that's a whirlwind overview. Those are my three heads of the dog called risk, but uh, I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. And, f and for the audience, thank you, Mills. That, that was great. And for the audience, I sat next to Mills for 10 years in my career. Do you know now why I don't sleep? So <laughs> fantastic. And, and Mills, I don't know if you go to the polls, you will see uh, at the bottom right, you'll see where the audience came in, which is great stuff. And yeah. I think it's uh, overwhelming. I don't know if you want to touch on that real quick and then we'll-, we'll Yeah, I'd like, I completely agree. Like global inflation came in at 50% of the vote and as, as large as followed by- Europe's energy crisis at 23, disrupted supply chains 21, strong US dollar at six. So I'm glad I actually covered the top three uh, from the vote in, in my in my comments there. But yeah, I think because you know there that where there's crisis, there's opportunity. You know, in disrupted supply chains, you can create new supply chains. In energy, you can find new sources and create new new types of energy. But with inflation, it's just defeating to everyone. It's just really really difficult. Really yeah. Mills, so. thank you very very much. Um, to get to uh, appreciate that from a broker's perspective, from a credit risk manager's perspective, again, using my I, I can't do a presentation without some sort of uh, analogy to sports. We have our cleanup hitter uh, with Gordon from an executive perspective who's running uh, one of the, the big three within the U.S. And what I wanted Gordon to do, and he also has a poll question, which he'll, he'll raise is really what is the relevance of, of, of credit insurance and, and why why do people buy and how? How he's managing that uh, in this very sort of disruptive environment right now. Gordon, let me turn it over to you. Brett, thank you, uh, fellow panelists. Thank you for your uh, your deep insight. I'm not sure if I will leave this conversation happier or sadder, uh, but uh, nevertheless, it's good to share uh, share views. And of course, uh, Richard and I, Caesar, uh, thank you for uh, for inviting me. Before I get started, uh, yeah, there is uh, a new a new poll, a new question, uh, hopefully on screen, um, which I hope will prompt some thoughts or at least uh, some some yeah some thought process uh, on on our audience. And and it's very straightforward. Over the last three years, have you reviewed or changed your credit process, your credit procedures? So no change, no thought. Have thought about it, reviewed, and no change. And I've made uh, have made changes to the process, so we'll uh, we'll come back to that um, uh, a little bit later on. Um, I want to take really I haven't got three heads of dogs or anything like that. I'm not I'm not so smart, um, but I just do want to cover off uh, three uh, three key topics. Firstly, I want to talk about relevance, and yeah, we've we've all said it. Uh, credit insurance has gone through a fairly kind of benign uh, claims environment over the last two years. Um, and actually, in terms of the top line, uh, which, uh, you know, our premiums and our client interest, we've actually got been fairly robust as an industry. So customers, clients are still coming. Banks are still looking to, to lay off risks. Um, and, and it's a very benign claims environment. So the two of those uh, is uh, obviously for the time being uh, is, is, a, is a good situation for a risk underwriter. Having said that, we clearly see that that's not, uh, con you know, sustainable. Okay, um, as as Mills has eloquently put, uh, we've got a raft of economic and geopolitical risks uh, and pressures building. Supply chain disruption, 
inflation, uh, rising interest rates to try and control inflation, rising energy costs, energy shortages, uh, and then you throw on that the uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, we've got uh, probably uh, two, so many things to consider and kind of juggle that I think uh, a number of people really are, are, are uh, struggling. So as a, as a credit management tool and as a credit uh, support, no doubt whatsoever in my mind, but you would expect me to say that, no doubt whatsoever in my mind that, uh, that trade credit is, is very relevant, both where we are now and more importantly, where we foresee things uh, in the coming months. Uh, secondly, uh, and again, uh, Brett, you, you uh, eloquently also, by the way, uh, at the start of the, of the panel, uh, you talked about why companies buy credit insurance. Uh, and obviously in the industry, I think we all know why that is. Uh, but to validate it, we uh, undertook a, a customer survey uh, between June and August this year. And one of the questions that we asked was, was exactly that. Why do you buy and take uh, credit insurance? Now, it will come as no surprise to anyone that in order of uh, kind of, you know, uh, importance, mitigating credit risk, improving credit management, and giving greater customer insight were the highest ranked uh, reasons for, for, for using trade credit. Um, not unsurprising, given where we are in the credit cycle, given everything that Scott's just said, um, that, that Mills has said, and, and as Brett introduced at the beginning. However, if you look at the survey, which we did two years, uh, three years ago, should I say, in the top three were sales growth and access to finance. So I think we're in a, in a kind of a switch uh, position in terms of the product justification. And again, perhaps not unsurprising as to where we are in, in the current uh, cycle and, and the concerns that everyone, everyone has. Just to, just to, again, probably reiterate more than anything, credit insurance is a product which is available from you know, SMEs up to multinationals, to banks, trade credit, structured credit coverage. Structures are, are wide ranging in terms of whole turnover, single situation, excess of loss. So it really is um, a product for, for all. And, and I would suggest a, a product for, for the moment. Finally, I just want to talk about uh, the, the, the topic of underwriting during a downturn. Um, and we get regularly asked, you know, what, what happens when, you know, there is a downturn, what happens when there's a recession, et cetera. And, and the way I answer it is very, very straightforward. First of all, this is not the, our first rodeo. Uh, you can tell from my accent, I'm not from the US. So I'd like to pick up uh, expressions and that's, that's one of my favorite. Actually, Mills used my other favorite, which is, is the juice worth the squeeze? So I'm glad I didn't use it in this, uh, this brief presentation. So it's not our first rodeo. We, most of us have been in the industry for a long, long time. We've seen at least a global fi financial crisis, and some of us have seen the Asian crisis before that. Um, and, and those that haven't been around for so long, they've got enough uh, sort of gray hairs, if you like, to, to guide, uh, guide, be guided through, uh, so through this process. I would say the industry as a whole has learned from, from history, and that's a, that can only be a good thing, is that there is no broad brush um, solution to this. And, and I firmly believe that there really shouldn't be a broad brush uh, solution. Yes, we're looking at financial information, financial statements. Yes, we're looking at perhaps less structured data and softer information. We're also relying very heavily uh, on information coming from our clients and our customers. Uh, you know, how's the trading going? What are the payments? Uh, how are they? Uh, how, uh, how are buyers paying? Um, and from, a, from an underwriting perspective, in the current environment, risk appetite is supportive. We're keeping a very, very close eye on certain sectors of the economy. Uh, particularly, I guess, those that are in capital intensive, highly leveraged sectors, uh, given the, the kind of the hawkish stance taken by central banks, uh, hoping to ease that inflationary pressure. As I say, as an industry, I think we've learned, uh, certainly from the, the GFC, the global financial crisis, we've got much better alignment uh, of the various stakeholder interests. Um, 
in terms of both the communication and the collaboration and ultimately minimizing as much as we possibly can uh, customer uh, disruption. I think as an industry, again, and certainly here, we believe in partnership with clients uh, and with broker partners, and we tend to look for input and support when we're looking at um, uh, align, uh, aligning and creating our, our strategy in, uh, in the downturn. That was a really quick uh, rumble through kind of relevance, uh, why people are buying credit insurance and, uh, and you know, underwriting in a downturn, which you know, people, those on this call and, and, and obviously the, the industry uh, experts, so-called experts on, uh, on the panel, we're, we're, not, we're not afraid. It's not our first rodeo. We've been here before and we'll manage with clients and with the market uh, through whatever is going to, uh, to come at us. Brett, I hope that was useful, some useful Gordon, insight. Gordon, that was fantastic and, and a great segue. And again, uh, with uh, my new job with Aminta is, is a new startup MGA uh, for SCORE. Uh, I've already received a lot of questions in regards to a geez with the environment. Why do you want to get into you know starting up? Well, this is the perfect time for credit insurance to be starting up in a recessionary climate uh, because this is, the, the, this is when the clients need it. I think to your point, Gordon, and one that I a question that I have, and then I want you to, to address your, your poll question. And we do have one question, too, from Tiziana I want to get to before we, we conclude is all of us have been around long enough, as you indicated, to see the cycles, Asia, Latin America, South America, the GFC, even you know, some underwriters certainly recently uh, through, through COVID. But as Scott indicated, that the losses just weren't there. So we have a little bit of a generational gap. I know we do have some young up and comers coming in, but there is even some concern from my side that a lot of the folks that are sort of new to the business, you know, less than 12 years in, they really haven't seen this. So how do we, and again, I know ICISA is, is planning another session, I think tomorrow in regards to justice, how do we bring in new talent to, you know, cause this is really exciting stuff. I mean, this is high finance. This is, this is really cool from a broker, credit perspective from, from where we sit, Gordon, this is really cool stuff. How do we bring in new blood? Yeah, it's, it's, it's something that I, we struggle with uh, every day. And I'm Scott, I'm sure that uh, Mills and Scott have, have the same thing when they're trying to build, build teams and, and, and encourage people back into the business or into the business. Listen, people are at the heart of our, our business and our industry, right? They are the on, only asset that we have. Um, and having, I can tell you, having spent 25 plus years in the industry, it remains for me challenging, exciting, no two days are the same. And I think the onus falls, Brett, on us, on, on, yeah. on you know, us to encourage, to build, to, to bring in new, new talents and new blood uh, and to get, get them involved and get excited about credit insurance. I know for a fact that I am uh, and, uh, you know, I know, I know my fellow panelists are all excited. But I think it falls to us to, to really, you know, get those uh, those new talents involved and get excited about it. Yeah, thank you, Gordon, for that. The uh, the poll questions have, have been answered. I don't know, Gordon, if you can see those. It looks yeah, uh, I can. Uh, and uh, uh, please I'm, I'm, respond. Yeah, I'm in, I'm encouraged um, uh, that almost sixty percent uh, of respondents said that they have made changes to the process. Um, reviewed a no change six percent. What, I, what I'd always say is, you know, we have to be flexible, we have to be agile, we have to adapt um, to whatever is uh, the, the, the situation and the circumstances are. So people who have taken the time perhaps to review those processes, to make changes, um, I, I think is absolutely the right, uh, the right way to go. Uh, and if, if you are in the 6% of uh, reviewed and no change or, or maybe no change, haven't even thought about it, Maybe uh, it's a good time to to think about it. Consult with uh, you know your trusted third party, whether that's a broker or an underwriter, and have those kind of discussions because it, for, for no doubt uh, we've got some uh, some headwinds that continuing against us. For sure. Hey Brad, I can jump in on just one thing because you you learn something. Doesn't matter how old you are in this industry. Every time you go through a downturn, and it's mostly from a risk underwriting perspective. But for the supply chain, right? If you take a manufacturer who is you know, counting on the supply to come in for them to add whatever they're going to add to the process and create the finished good. Now you have a lot of these manufacturers that just like the big autos who are stacking up inventory, which they can't turn into finished goods. So they're 
they're pulling down their financing arm and now they're maxing that out. And now if the supply chain continues to be clogged, they can't turn these goods into cash. So it doesn't mean that the company's not healthy, doesn't know what it's doing, isn't in a good competitive position. It has everything now to do with getting choked out because of the supply chain. So if you don't have access to liquidity, that type of stuff, it hurts. And if you look at trying to finance inventory, you're financing inventory that at this point is worthless because you can't make it an end good. Right. So that's something new that I learned in this and saying, here's profitable companies, companies that are doing things right. But supply chains now really hurting them. So I think, you know, every every downturn, you just learn something else. You go, wow, I didn't see that coming. Right. And that's, yeah. So I don't know, Mills, are you seeing any of that? Yeah, I mean, it's funny you're talking about like what we what we learn. Um, it's funny you mentioned earlier about how the COVID, the inception of COVID turned out to be a hiccup. It looked like it was going to be a, a dark wave of disaster. Uh, government saved us. Fiscal stimulus, all the PPP loans, the individual stimulus checks. Plus, you just had excessive monetary stimulus. It kept the capital markets flowing. And so after a few months where there, there was a big surge of Chapter 11s and Chapter 7s, it calmed down very quickly, um, uh, much to a lot of our surprise. So, um, and, and it made me think, you know, even as we see all the risks right now going going forward into the end of the year and into next year, you know, never underestimate the power of the government to step in and do something um, that that could could potentially make it a lot uh, a lot less painful than it could be. Agree. Yeah. Thank you, guys, very, very much. And again, I'm very conscious of time. I know we've already just come up on the uh, three o'clock hour here on the East Coast of the States. But uh, I did have one question. And, and Richard, if you need to put the hand up and say stop, we'll do it. But um, uh, Tiziana did ask, and it just, I think a quick answer from the panel. Has there been a shift in interest to in non-can offerings as corporates become anxious about a pending or currently happening downturn? Scott, Gordon? Yeah, I mean, I, from a broker's perspective, I have not seen it. Um, you know, you have customers and I, again, I'll pick on the banks. A lot of the banks love the ability of the cancelable limits. Just they just need some timing to be able to, you know, delayed effect to be able to help them out because the, the cancelable markets have their finger on the pulse on a daily basis and it helps supplement what the banks are doing. Right. And a lot of customers, corporates feel the same way. There are certainly aspects where people would want the non can. They're, they've been burned during the GFC or whatever and they can't get over that aspect of it and they want full control. Um, so I haven't seen a shift either way, you know, you know, one way or the other on this one. I just know there's value in both offerings and, and haven't seen anything that, that, that I would think was material shift in either, in either direction. Yeah, yeah, Brett I, I, and Scott, I completely agree. I think the, the, the mix, if you like, can mm -hmm. non cam um, has not changed dramatically. Yes, there's a higher level of interest in, uh, in the product, full stop. The, the, the actual mix is, has not changed dramatically. Yeah. I think delayed effect in 07 and 08, when that that was an old endorsement that was dusted off and used after that, has yeah. really changed any downturn now that will come out, especially for the cancelable limits, because all the all the, the companies really want is a heads up and an ability to be able to talk about a credit and not have an instant pulling of the limit. So if it's a future pull, based on, hey, this is what's going on. It really gets everybody to clear their order book, go out without any emotion and be able to talk about do we what can we do to either implement this credit or not, or should we all walk away from it? So I think that may have solved the issue, I think, going forward between can and non-can, what's good to downturn or not. I see them both as highly valuable products. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. And and Mills, Gordon, Scott, thank you. And it, Scott's, I think, right on. As, as you know, we, we've been veterans in this market for a long time, but you do learn something every day. You really do. That's the uniqueness of, of, of this industry. And we did receive another comment from Paul Hagley in regards to the how do we bring in you know, new talent uh, from college graduates to the like and, and spur interest in, in, in our industry. And again, I, I certainly suggest, and Richard, I know you'll touch on, please uh, please do uh, tie in tomorrow's session uh, that touches just on that. And I, I think you'll, we'll get some more answers in terms of how we can how we can spark interest. But on behalf of the panel, uh, I want to thank Richard. I want to thank Isisa, Awang. The whole team has been super great in regards to providing us uh, all the, the equipment and the uh, and the topic to discuss and it's uh, i feel like we could probably sit on for another two hours and and keep uh, keep the banter going but uh 
really do appreciate it. And thanks everyone for attending. And Richard, let me turn it uh, back over to you. Well, thank you, Brett. Your, your thanks for making me blush because I wanted to say exactly the same. So Gordon, Scott, Mills, Brett, fantastic conversation. Thank you very much. I'm sure that the audience took a number of things home and took a number of things to think about and see how they can contribute to how this U.S. market is going to develop further in future. So thank you very, very much for that. And Brett just foreshadowed it tomorrow at 10 CET. So that is 4 a.m. Eastern time, by which time all the folks in Florida will be awake anyway. <laughs> there is going to be a lovely, very important panel on attracting and retaining talent. To me, this is one of the most important topics there is in this Trade Credit Insurance Week. So I hope to see you there. I hope to hear your ideas, hear your questions. And in the meantime, have a nice news. Goodbye, all. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.